particularly surreal. It was a, a pretty amazing day. Like the morning actually was probably one of the worst days of my life in terms of the pressure. When you had a, a seven-time world champion chasing you down in, in Seb Ogier, you just actually physically felt sick from the pressure. Like it come down to a last stage battle and it was a, an all or nothing type stage for us because the gap was down to two seconds and we just drove the stage of our life. <laughs> Welcome to the HPA Tuned In Podcast. I'm Andre, your host, and in this episode, we're joined by New Zealand's very own Hayden Patton. Now, if you haven't heard the name Hayden Patton, then he is a local rally driver. He made it all the way to the pinnacle of the sport, driving in the WRC for Hyundai and even winning the 2016 Rally of Argentina. Now, that is no mean feat, and it is incredibly difficult if you're a rally driver based outside of Europe to break in to the WRC. These days Hayden is locally based and rallying here in New Zealand but he's also involved in European rallying. He is currently leading the European Rally Championship with I think a couple of rounds left to go so he's in a pretty good place right now to wrap up that championship fingers crossed. Now fun fact and little claim to fame here. Hayden is based just down the road from us at High Performance Academy. He's based in Cromwell, about a 45 minute drive away. And he competed in our local Coronet Peak Hill Climb a couple of years ago in his electric rally car, which we'll talk about as we get through our interview. And my little claim to fame here, after two of the three runs were allowed up the hill, I was actually a little bit faster than him. Now, Full disclosure here, the reason I was faster than him is they were having some teething issues with the car for the third and final run. Unfortunately, they got those teething issues sorted out and and he smoked me. But still, ignoring that third and final run, I was beating Hayden Patton and I'm pretty proud of that. Now before we get into our chat with Hayden Patton, for those who are fresh to the HPA Tuned In podcast, High Performance Academy is an online training school. We specialise in teaching people how to tune EFI, build performance engines, construct wiring harnesses. We also cover topics on race car setup, driver education, data analysis and even fabrication topics. Now, all of our courses are delivered via high definition video modules that you can take from anywhere in the world provided you've got an internet connection and as a podcast listener you can use the coupon code podcast 75 that'll get you $75 off the purchase of your very first HPA course we'll put a link to that coupon code in the show notes and you can head to hpacademy.com forward slash courses for a full list of our courses enough with that introduction let's get into our interview now all right, welcome to the podcast, Hayden. Thanks for joining us today. And like usual, let's start by finding out a little bit about your background, specifically how you got interested in cars and rallying. Yeah, well, uh, thanks for having me, Andre. It's um, good to catch up. But uh, yeah, I guess uh, cars and rallying has sort of more or less been in the blood. My father was a rally driver growing up, so um, I was probably given no choice in some respects that that's what I was brought up around and, and uh, dragged along to as a kid. And um, it's my only memories in life is around cars or race cars or rally cars and, and whatever it may be. It's just been an interest since I was pretty well predisposed for that career then. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all I know. How did it sort of pan out from sort of following your parents around your dad, watching him and rally to actually getting into the driver's seat yourself for the first time? started in the traditional ways I guess as a kid yeah I think uh, dad brought me a motorized sort of car that I could drive around on the front lawn when I was two or three years old and had all the matchbox toys cars and you tip all the pop plant dirt out onto the onto the carpet in, in the house and use that the the racy cars and, and then started in go-karts uh, at the age of six so uh wasn't the fastest of go-karts to begin with it was only powered by a chainsaw motor but then from there you just went through the the, I guess the stages through grass carts and then into racing carts around a proper racetrack and then of course in New Zealand you can get your motorsport license when you're 12 years old so as soon as I was 12 it was a matter of getting that license and getting into my first car which was a little mini and then starting uh, I guess the journey from there. Alright so on that journey I mean this is something that if you're not involved particularly if you haven't had family to sort of guide you and show you that the pathway it can be a little bit daunting trying to figure out how you you actually get into competition and do it the right way so are there any tips you could give to our younger listeners who are maybe on the fence maybe they want to try some some autocrosses grass carners whatever that might be or, or circuit racing in their own cars you know, how do you go about doing that yeah it certainly is daunting when you're not in, in the right environment to know how to naturally do it but it's actually a lot easier than what a lot of people think like particularly here in New Zealand it is a matter of just simply getting a, a club sport motorsport license. You can turn up to local car clubs where you can do autocross motor carners, 
even in your daily running car, you don't even need a proper race car. Chuck 20 bucks of fuel on it. Often I'll only have a $20 entry fee and you can go out and have some, some fun for the day. And that's what Grassroots Motorsport's all about. It's about having fun in a controlled environment. But also more so from that is that by joining the car clubs, there's a lot of like-minded people within all the car clubs. And, you know, even for myself, you found that they were willing to help with advice or how you go into the next event or things you can do to your car. And you're just within a community of people that are willing to, to help each other. And, and ultimately, they're all doing what they enjoy doing. So the first step is joining the local car club. It's the same as joining a rugby club, soccer club, whatever it may be. You can do the same with a car club and then that can help you take it from there. Okay. In terms of cars, as you mentioned there, you absolutely can start out at the lower levels with your daily driven road car. And I mean, if you're competing in the likes of a, a grass carna, for example, often it's difficult, but I'm not going to say impossible to actually come unstuck and, and do some serious damage. So it's a, a fairly low risk environment to experiment and actually start building up some skills. Uh, so that's important to mention. When you started competing, you mentioned there you had a, a Mini. Is that the car you started rallying in? Uh, no, my first rally car was actually my father's Toyota Corolla AE101. But yeah, the Mini probably didn't have the legs to go out and do a, a full rally. But in terms of motor carners and autocrosses, it was a perfect first car. Like the, the big thing that my father hammered into me from a driver development perspective and developing the right driving techniques was to learn in a front-wheel drive car because in a front-wheel drive car you, you learnt the skill set that was relevant to when later on in a four-wheel drive car about carrying corner speed about left foot braking about a lot of these simple principles that help you drive a car quickly whereas of course a rear-wheel drive car is a lot more fun but it doesn't teach you the essentials of corner speed and momentum and things that are more relevant to when you're in a four-wheel drive car so one of the biggest keys when I started was about having a front-wheel drive car then it was about trying to find something cheap. So my Mini I bought for 500 bucks. Nowadays they're a bit more collectible than what they were <laughs> 20 odd years ago. But it's just about buying something that, well, in our case it's cheap, but you can also source parts for and that you can work on the car easily yourself. Okay, I mean, cheap definitely makes sense. And the availability of parts, obviously while you're building up these skills, you're probably going to come unstuck a few times and do some damage. So if you can repair it quickly and cheaply, then that's obviously going to be a big benefit. I'm interested to dive into the, the front-wheel drive element. Now, we have talked about this on the podcast a, a couple of times previously, so we are treading on some material we've probably already covered, but I think those who are maybe just spectating and rallying would assume that rear-wheel drive is, is sort of the place you'd want to start. And you look at the rally cars of years gone by, escorts, etc., going through corners, completely crossed up sideways. That's kind of what we think of with rally. We see a little bit less of the extreme sideways with the current crop of four-wheel drives. But front-wheel drive on face value, you wouldn't really think it would lend itself nicely to rally. So why is it such a good training tool? More often than not in this sport, it's often what looks slow and sometimes even feels slow is actually fast. And in our sport, the rallying is ultimately is the battle against the stopwatch. It doesn't matter what it looks or feels like, it's, it's you're trying to beat the stopwatch. And going straight on a, on a loose surface is actually quite challenging because obviously the gravel and, and they're acting like a ball bear in effect. So the car's wanting to slide and it's wanting to move around and actually you're trying to counter that by trying to keep the car as straight as possible to ultimately go as fast as possible. And Obviously, with the front-wheel drive car, you're essentially obviously pulling from the front on the throttle, which is helping you build the momentum, particularly on corner exits, a lot quicker and easier. Whereas when you've got the rear-wheel drive car and you're trying to push the car through the corner, particularly if you're pre-apex and you're trying to come on the throttle, then, of course, if the rear is quite locked or quite quite stiff, then, of course, the first thing it wants to do is slide. So rather than all the energy of the car wanting to go straight, it's actually going diagonally and you're not actually getting the full input of uh, acceleration to go forward. So... The front-wheel drive car gives you more potential to do that. Of course, you often see a lot more rear-wheel drive cars have got more power. Like an Escort rally car has often got more power than a little Toyota Corolla. So, you know, you often see the rear-wheel drive cars still doing very well. And they are a lot more fun and, like you say, more spectacular. But from a driver development perspective, when you're young or new, front-wheel drive, for me, is the best place to start. Okay. And on that note, I'm guessing, basically, the, the handling balance and the driving techniques or skills between a front-wheel drive and a four-wheel drive are more aligned than rear-wheel drive and four-wheel drive? That's sort of what you're getting at? Yeah, very similar. So like throttle inputs is a big thing. So in a front-wheel drive car, you're trying to come on the throttle and try to be quite committed. Very similar to circuit racing. You're trying to do like one brake input, one throttle input and try and build into the throttle. 
rear-wheel drive car, you often got to play off the throttle a lot, which is just because, you know, they're very reactive and they're, they're lively and moving around. If you went and did that in a four-wheel drive car, you're on a hide into nothing. So it's probably teaching you the wrong driving input, uh, if you like. Yeah, okay. So essentially, while we see rally as cars being super sideways going through the corners and, and it's great to watch, the reality is what you're actually trying to do to go faster is reduce that and be more of a almost a, a, a road race or circuit race line through the corner, limiting how sideways you're going so you can get the power down and accelerate. Yeah, there's a lot of variables, but generally you're trying to keep the car as straight as possible. For me, there's different driving styles. So for me, I like to have the car straight on exit. But I try and uh, I do all my sliding and all my rotation before the corner. So often I'll be quite sideways before a corner because I'm using that to also slow the car down. But then from mid to exit, I'm trying to be very straight. So if I come off a corner with a lot of anti steer or anti lock, then I'm losing time. But then some drivers, like when we were in the WRC team with Terry Neville, he was very pointy, very straight into the corner, very loose in all the setup and the differential. So he could literally just turn the car and it would turn and try and come off the corner straight. So Everyone's got a different driving style. So there's no sort of one size fits all answer to this is how your rally car should be set up and this is how you should drive it to extract maximum time. No, everyone's different. I think the, the big thing is that you have to be straight on exit. So no matter what driving style, you know, it can all vary between entry and mid, but on exit you have to be straight. So you, when you're on the throttle, you're accelerating in a straight line and get maximum speed. Well, one thing I have always wondered, just coming from my own circuit racing and hill climb background on tarmac, is that on a circuit in particular, we, we try really to, to limit how much the car is sliding around. You, you're taking a conventional racing line through the corner, braking, child braking into the corner and then getting back on the throttle as we exit the corner. And that's generally accepted, that's the fast way around and it's also kind of minimising how much you're beating up on the tyres. However, you watch any WRC event on a tarmac uh, stage and the drivers are just as sideways as they are on gravel. I'm wondering what's the disconnect there between how we drive a car on a, on a, a road race circuit versus a tarmac rally stage? Why is, why is sliding still faster? I wouldn't say sliding. For me, it is a lot closer than what it is on gravel. The limitation is the tyres. So like when we're on the gravel rallies, we have a like a, essentially a semi-slick tyre because you need a tyre that can work in various conditions. Often the road's dirty for us. We don't have like a completely clean racetrack, so the car's moving on the loose stones or dirt that's been dragged out. But also the tyres, they move around a lot as well. So to compensate that, you, you do have to be a little bit more aggressive on the car and on the chassis to to compensate for the lack of performance from the tyres and that does mean the car moves around a little bit more. but the general driving habits is very similar to what we do on the racetrack in terms of trying to get on the throttle really early trying to carry the speed trying to let the car flow is the biggest thing not trying to kill the speed not trying to over brake or over slow the car it's just about the same as a racetrack letting the car flow one brake application one throttle application and trying to be smooth but like you say the car is moving around somewhat more than what it does on the racetrack just coming back to what you mentioned there with gravel being pulled onto the road even on a tarmac stage so i'm interested how do you develop your driving through a stage because you've gone through and we'll talk about pace notes as we go through this but you've got your pace notes you know what the corner is coming up you've got that dialed in based on the passes you've had through that stage and I'm guessing at that point, obviously, no competitive cars have gone through the stage. Everything's nice and swept and clean. And then once the first half a dozen competitors have gone through and they've cut some corners and they've pulled gravel onto the tarmac, how do you approach that when you come up to a corner that you think should be relatively fast and then all of a sudden commit to that corner and it's covered in gravel? It's really tough on new rallies that you haven't done before because if it's a rally you've done before or a stage that you've done before, you have a bit of information of where you expect dirt and pollution to be pulled onto the road and you adapt to it. On new rallies, you are simply doing it on what you see and you have to adjust on the spot. So you are having to make really quick reactions. You have to stay in the line. It's, it's no different to gravel. You've got to stay in the clean line. So if stones and marbles and everything are on the road, You've got to go where the two clean lines are, which might mean you have to put half the car off the road and in, in the cut, for example, because if you stay in, the, in that loose stuff, it is like ball bearings and you've, you've got no control. So you have to adjust on the fly. And that's the beauty of our sport with rallying. It, there are so many variables and it is always changing. It, it keeps us on, on our toes. And that's, I guess, what keeps us, I guess, excited by the sport as a driver. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, one other element, just in terms of the, the driving techniques with rally, the braking 
I think I've I had the benefit many years ago of, of sitting in the co-driver's seat with one of our local competitors and I think for anyone who hasn't been for a ride in a rally car it, it's an absolute eye-opener not necessarily in the outright performance in terms of acceleration. I mean, ultimately, these cars aren't hugely powerful, but the eye-opener for me was the braking performance, particularly on, on loose gravel. But conventionally, on a tarmac piece of road, we know that maximum braking performance comes without the wheels locked. However, on gravel, as I understand, it's quite different because you sort of, if you're locking, you can get through that sort of surface layer of gravel and down to what's below getting more braking performance. So can you talk us through through that? Or was everything I just said complete garbage? No, like you, I wouldn't say we, we search for locking of the wheels, but we don't dislike the wheels locking. And it's always in that initial braking application where your first braking application, you know, you're putting 60 odd bar of pressure through the brake pedal to really get the grip. But as a driver, a little bit like what you say, as a driver, that initial braking application, you actually get a feel for the grip of how much grip there is on that particular braking point or corner or whatever it may be. And if the wheels are locking, then you know you've got high grip. So often then you can roll out the brakes a little bit earlier to try and get the car to roll to the corner. Or if you, if you tend to find that it's, it's locking and sliding, then you know you don't have a lot of grip and then you've got to sort of pulsate the pressure a, lot of it, a little bit more. And rather than it being like a very straight up and down, like tarmac, like linear braking uh, application, if it's very slippery, you often find you've got a bit of a tabletop because you're trying to find the grip as you get closer to the corner. So the cars break very well but it's it's a combination of the tires the tires are exceptional on gravel we're obviously pretty used to it but yeah people who are not so familiar with gravel when they hop in like you say that's the first thing that they notice but also i think it's just the way the suspension and the inertia of the chassis is working with the suspension and you're loading up that front tire which is helping you slow down and, and also it's unloading the rear which helps you rotate the car so it's about everything just working in combination with each other sure yeah that makes sense in terms of coming from New Zealand and obviously making it to WRC, the pinnacle of the sport, I kind of assume that we have a disadvantage here in New Zealand with the access to sort of just building up your skill set. Obviously, we don't have much, if anything, in the way of snow and ice, which a lot of the European rallies do. And you know, compared to the likes of maybe some of the European and Scandinavian drivers where even their taxi drivers are opposite locking through roundabouts in, in the middle of winter, you know, that becomes a, a natural sort of skill that they don't even need to think about. So from New Zealand, how, how do you go about building up that skill set and being competitive against these, these European drivers? Yeah, obviously we grow up on gravel here in New Zealand. So when we go overseas, we've got some good experience in terms of gravel, but rallying, like you say, is so much more than gravel. I think of in the WRC, maybe 60% of the championship is gravel and then the rest is either tarmac or snow. And to be fair, the only way you build up that up is that you, you essentially just got to get to Europe as soon as you can or another country that has different types of surfaces and you just have to get seat time on these rallies with the different surfaces. And, you know, from our side, you know, working with teammates uh, where you can get data from your teammates and learn. There's lots of driver trainers and driving schools in Europe that you sort of lean on to get more experience as well. And it's like anything in life. You just have to jump in the deep end sometimes and learn how to swim. And as time goes on, you just refine um, the process. But for sure, coming from New Zealand, you know, we do lack tarmac rallying. I'm obviously biased towards gravel because that's what I enjoy more. But of course, you know, in terms of young drivers who want to go overseas, that's probably the biggest thing that we lack is trying to get more time and experience on tarmac like I've, even now i've probably only still done 30 40 tarmac rallies in my career whereas a lot of the people that we're competing with overseas they've probably done that in their first two or three years of rallying so um even to this day after 20 years of rallying we still don't have a lot of experience on tarmac just because of the conversation we've just had about the similarities to circuit racing and i know that you know over the last five or so years you've been pretty active in circuit racing here in new zealand as well and, and proven that the talents you've got on gravel work just as well on a racetrack but is that a viable technique to learn tarmac rally i mean obviously there are some still some pretty big disconnects but yeah you know, and if that's the only option you've got in terms of uh, upping your skill set on tarmac is it viable oh 100 so when we were in the WRC, that was obviously when I was living overseas and we were trying to learn and, and, and get up to speed. Obviously, post WRC, when I come back to New Zealand, we're now living here at Highland. So we've got, we've got a place right on the side of the racetrack here. And like you say, we've done a little bit of circuit racing, not a whole lot, but done a little bit over the last few years and obviously done a bit of shakedowns and stuff with cars on tracks from time to time here. But because of that experience, just living here at the racetrack and spending more time on the racetrack, I'm now a much better tarmac driver than what I was in the WRC. And that's just come because I've spent more time on the track, 
you've refined your, your skills and now in a better place when you go do tarmac rallies as well. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. All right, let's get sort of into some of the more nitty gritty. And um, you've got a, a, a book that you put out quite a while ago, sort of a autobiography of, of your sort of experience up to the point you sort of were in WRC. And I know that you made quite a big point in that book earlier on about the importance of learning centre diff tuning. And I think if my memory serves correct, that was uh, sort of around the Mitsubishi Evo 8 and, and 9 platform. But I read that book a few years ago, so forgive me if I've got it wrong. Just in terms of that, let, let's start with what is the centre diff for those who have no idea what we're talking about? And then what control over that centre diff have you got with modern electronic centre diff controllers? This was back in the Mitsubishi and Subaru days. It had the uh, active electronic centre diffs. Nowadays, actually, a lot of the cars are mechanical, fixed mechanical diffs. So we've gone away from that somewhat now just to try and keep things a little bit more simple. But yeah, like you say, back in those days when we were a small local team here, we're just family and friends and you're trying to develop things. And naturally, I've always been a very competitive person, always looking for the next edge, whether it be myself or the car, whatever it may be. And it just come a point with the car where we thought, okay, we want to find something more. So we wanted to start dabbling with the center diff controller, which is obviously like its own little standalone computer. I'm not an engineer or mechanic, so you probably know a lot more about it than what myself does. But essentially, obviously, the center diff controller is effectively controlling the amount of drive that's split between the front and rear differential. So often, I believe on the Mitzi, it was more controlling how much drive was going to the rear because the front was fixed. But for us, with the amount of parameters and control you could have over how much drive it was put into the rear, whether it was under braking, how much yaw you had on the car, um, how much throttle input you had in the car. And basically, we got to a point where I learned to map the diffs to my driving style. And it was a matter of, you know, we didn't do it in any scientific way. We actually started very, very basic. Uh, we went out to a forest and the best way for me to learn to begin with is real simple. We just put everything to one extreme on the map, went out and drove it, come back, put everything to the other extreme on the map, drove it, okay. And then you could see, okay, you could see it did this part and the brake and this part and the throttle. I didn't like this bit, I did like this bit and pretty much combine all those notes with the standard base maps that we began with and then started tuning from there. And we pretty much moved the maps a long way. Essentially got it all to a place where I could drive the car straight on the exit and from that I was identifying how I'd normally drive the car. So I'd go into the data, analyse, okay, what percentage of throttle am I trying to pick up from the apex to the exit at what your control and at what speed and then I'd go into the diff map at that point and go all right at that point the car's too taily so I need to bring some rear diff out of it so you take you tame all that back and then it was just a long process you know we we're developing our own diff maps over one or two years and it was just through trial and error and even to this day with our development and driving like obviously we've got engineers involved and people that we work with and trust but also I love being involved in the engineering, engineering myself because I can feel what's going on with the car and trying to translate that into then the changes that you're doing rather than just coming back with feedback and going okay there you go engine, um, engineer you change it that's my feedback I like to be involved and actually go hang on that may or may not work and it's about working collaboratively as a team with your engineer and, and bits and pieces so but yeah, we found a lot in the diff maps and then that's essentially what helped us win our first New Zealand title uh, was getting that car tuned in for my driving style and, and effectively helped me be more comfortable in the car. So obviously a lot of control, as you've just mentioned, I, I'm assuming there, depending on your settings, under braking you can control what the diff's doing. So I'm guessing here, depending on your settings, that will either improve the turn-in or make the car tend to push at turn-in. And likewise, you mentioned on the corner exit, you can make it more like a front wheel drive as opposed to too much rear bias and that's going to start making the car push sideways or break into to oversteer on the corner exit. Would you change those settings dramatically depending on the surface as well? I mean obviously as we already talked about here in New Zealand we, we don't really have tarmac but I mean even when you've got gravel I mean dramatically different levels of grip I can only assume between a dry day where it's all dusty, swept maybe versus heavy gravel versus a torrential downpour and you're in the mud. Yeah there's always a real balance in that so essentially the more grip you got, the more unlocked you can be on the differentials, whether it's be with a centre diff or with a mechanical diff ramps. And then the less grip you, you've got, the more locked you want to be because you're trying to find the grip. You're trying to find mechanical grip. But then the offside to that is, is of course, the more locked you are, whether it be with centre diffs or diff ramps, then the less drivable the car is. It's, it's harder to drive. You've got to fight the car more. So there's a real balancing act in trying to get the car with enough grip through the differentials, but also keeping it drivable when you're in low grip situations. 
but then on tarmac, generally the tyre's got a lot of grip anyway with the tyre, and if, if the tarmac's a you know dry surface, for example, so then you're generally unlocking the diffs a lot to make the car, I guess, a lot more free and to make it easier for turn and rotation uh, in bits and pieces. So, yeah, it does depend on the surface a lot, quite like you say. But there's also a big aspect as well with differentials and with any part of car setup is it's about driver confidence as well. And I've always said, particularly in rallying, it's a little bit different to circuit because there is so many variables in our sport with the road surface and the conditions and the weather that a confident driver in a slow car will always be faster than an unconfident driver in a fast car. And, you know, essentially, especially with the cars that we have nowadays with Rally 2 uh, or even WRC, you know, they're all there or thereabouts. They're all built to a certain rule and regulation. They can't go outside homologation. So therefore, there's not much that you can push. It's not like you can go put more power in it, anything into them. But at tests and everything, we're all changing so many things still. And essentially, what we're trying to do is we're not really necessarily looking to make the car faster. We're trying to make the driver more comfortable and confident that then the driver will drive faster once you actually get into the rally. So it's all about fine tuning to make sure everything is all in sync with each other. Yeah, that makes sense. And coming back to what we were talking about earlier as well, there's no sort of one right setting that's going to suit everyone. It's finding that sort of happy performance envelope that's going to suit how you drive the car to give you that level of confidence. Yep, 100%. All right, let's move on and talk a, a little bit about uh, co-drivers and pace notes, which are obviously go hand in hand with rallying. And again, sort of following your career over time, uh, you've had a, a handful of different co-drivers, but you sort of seem to keep coming back to uh, John Kennard and having him in the car. What is it about the relationship that you and John have that's so special that he sort of keeps coming back and featuring as your co-driver? Yeah, I think he's retired two or three times now. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, no, he, he just loves loves the sport as much as what I do, and um, we're as good as a married couple now. Like I think we've more or less been in the car together for eighteen years, so we know each other's strengths and weaknesses, and we're quite different personalities. And obviously, he's a lot older than what I am, but it just works. And I have ultimate trust and faith in the job that he does, and and hopefully he does in the job that I do as well. So. Yeah, obviously, on the side of that, between both John and I, we have been trying to help and develop some young co-drivers as well and, and try and create a bit of a pathway there for the next generation. But in the meantime, while we're focusing on also what, what we're doing and trying to achieve things around around the world and, and in Europe, then, you know, why change something that's not broken type scenario? So, um, yeah, John still, um, you know, operates at a very high level and he enjoys it and we're both pretty driven to make sure we get the results. I can only assume it's a lot like what we are just talking about with the confidence in the car. If you've got the confidence in the co-driver, that again just allows you to relax and focus on the job of driving that car as fast as you can. In terms of the sort of key skills as you see them for a competitive co-driver, what would they be? Well, <laughs> you got to be brave because I wouldn't do it. Um, <laughs> to, to sit there I, and hate, the, I hate being in the passenger seat oh, of just about I, any car. I can't do it. I can't do it. And let alone reading pace notes, you know, to have the head down. Like as a co-driver, you, you've got to have a massive trust relationship with your driver because it is a team sport. You've got to be able to work together as a team. But there's also massive responsibility on the co-driver. So therefore, you know, in a lot of their roles, you need them to be calm. You need them to be relaxed, even if things are going pear-shaped. The co-driver is often the one who can bring everything back in check and, and a bit of a reality check, if you like, just to keep things on the straight and narrow. So the co-driver's role is effectively the admin person, but they're also, I guess, the in-car, I guess, mental aspect as well. And yeah, as I say, the biggest aspect is that you've got to get along with each other and, and you've got to work together. Definitely. You just mentioned sort of developing that next generation of co-drivers. That, that was going to be one of my questions. I mean, as far as I'm aware, at least, there's no rally co-drivers school that you go to and, and learn what pace notes are, how, how to develop them and how to read them back, etc. How does that work in reality? How are the current crop of co-drivers developing these skills? Yeah, look, there are a couple of uh, small uh, schools around, if you like, that help on some of the basics. But generally, it's a bit like driving that, that you, you essentially have to get in the car and get seat time. And you've got to develop a pace note system. Like obviously in New Zealand, we're quite lucky that we have the Jemba pace note system. So it's organiser pace notes that are provided to the competitors. And then it's up to the driver and co-driver to adapt it if they want to. But then, of course, during the rally, it's the co-driver's job to get up to speed with how they deliver those notes to their driver but a lot of other places around the world you don't get organizer notes you know you generally have to write your own pace notes from scratch which is obviously what we do now and but that's the normal in terms of global rallying so but it's the same it's time in the seat experience a lot of young co-drivers spending time with different drivers is actually very good as well because they learn different techniques from their drivers because every driver wants pace notes delivered in a different way and they want the information in a different way 
So just developing a, a large range of skill set it helps them become more adaptable. And then, yeah, just getting time. I think also it's about building a relationship then with a driver that you see a long-term future with. Because as I say, John and I, 18 years, we've built a good relationship. And that's probably helped us towards some of our success compared to if you're chopping and changing that relationship. So it's about trying to find someone that you want to build a long-term partnership with within the sport. Yep. One of the questions that I've always had is, you know, when you are taking a pass through a stage to develop your pace notes, at least as I understand it, you should be at normal road car speed. I don't know if that's always the way that pans out, but you come up to a corner at 50 kilometres an hour that in a rally you're going to be taking it, I don't know, maybe 80 to 100 kilometres an hour. Things look very different. So how do you sort of work on your pace notes and go, you know, is it just from experience you know what you're going to need to adjust with those pace notes versus going through at rally speed and road car speed? Yeah, it's a bit of both of, firstly, what tools that we use in the Ricky car to help us identify those corners. But also, secondly, like you say, experience. Experience is a big factor because when you're doing the reconnaissance, you're actually trying to visualize what you're doing in the rally car at two or three times the speed, how the car is going to react, what sort of speed you want to carry. So experience helps a lot with that. But then, of course, in the car, on the steering wheel, we have tape on the steering wheel, which we use as a guide to help us identify the gradients of the corners. And even though I could go down a road and write pace notes without that tape on the wheel, just from experience, I still only write pace notes with that tape because it means I use that. I just trust that system because I've always trusted it. I assign whatever number I turn the steering wheel to and then I don't even have to think about the gradient at the same time because I want to be thinking about all the other information. I want to be putting the pace notes in terms of the length of the corner, the apex, the width, the speed, if I can cut it, if I don't want to cut it. So I'm not having to even think about the number. I'm just turning the wheel, glancing at the steering wheel. Yep, that's the number. And then I add all the other information into the pace notes and you just trust that process. Uh, I guess that gives you that consistency as well when it is just that number on the steering wheel. In terms of adding that additional information in as well, I've also wondered, is there a degree of information overload or again, does that come down to your experience and proficiency basically? the information that a relatively new rally driver would want to hear from the pace notes versus the level of detail that you need to drive at the speed you do? Is there, again, a, a, quite a disconnect between the two? There's a big difference. Uh, like Our pace notes are a lot more complicated now than what they were when we first started writing notes. But likewise, you also have some drivers who have a very simple pace note system. They don't want a, an information overload. And then people like myself, I like a lot of information. I want information overload and Often on twisty technical rallies for John, that makes it very difficult for him because he has to talk nonstop. Like for one corner, we could have five or six pieces of information, but that corner might take half a second or less to actually drive around. And yet he's got to spit out probably two seconds of words for it type thing. So it is a balancing act to try not to have too much information. You know, pretty much the, the thing that John and I always discuss right from the early stages is that if I'm using all the information, then it's okay to have. But if I'm getting all this information and I'm not using half of it or it's going in, the, in one ear and out the other or it's, it's overload, then it's, it's too much. And that's very personalised on how much a driver can take in. Yeah. So on, on that same note, talking about the two seconds of information John has to provide you to get through a, a half a second corner, I'm assuming there that whereabouts he provides that information as you're coming up to that corner is also just as critical. I mean, there's no point getting that information when you're already on the brakes and turning into the corner. Is this, again, something that John now can just do? He knows when you need that information and you don't have to think about it, or are there areas where you have to sort of say, hey, I need the notes quicker or slower or, or you know, anything like that? Yeah, it does change sometimes. Generally, in, in the fast flowing stages, we want the, the notes probably two corners ahead. Uh, in the tight twisty where there's not a lot of momentum in the car, you're often one corner ahead because you're just trying to focus on driving the car as well. But where it gets really difficult for John is if you get into a stage, for example, it's rained and it's become very, very slippery, or we had in one of our previous rallies, the tyres were going completely off, overheating halfway through, and therefore you had to really sort of back off to manage the tyres. That's where John struggles, or well, not John, but any co-driver, because their head's down, so they have their natural sort of delivery of, yep, that's how fast I normally deliver the notes. But as soon as the car slows down from an outside reason, then the co-driver has to try and adapt, but then they have to actually start trying to look because I see what's going on, but the co-driver doesn't necessarily see what's going on. So um, that's where it becomes a big challenge for them. 
Yeah, on that note as well, when things change, is it up to John to also adapt the notes to suit? And I'm not talking about here delivery speed, but you know, if it's how tight the corner is or, or whatever, or are you still relying on those same notes and then you're adapting the speed of the car because you know that you know the tyres have gone away or it's it's rained and you did those notes dry, or whatever that may be? Yeah, no, the pace notes stay the same. Like you say, uh, as a driver, you adapt and it's about just keeping everything consistent and not having too many variables in there. This is going to be probably a difficult question to answer, but for those who, again, have no previous experience with rallying, could you give us an indication of what good quality notes does in terms of your time per kilometre versus if you were forced to drive that same stage blind? Uh, look at, I mean, obviously, it's going to depend <laughs> on the specifics of the stage. I mean, it's how long is a piece of string. Yeah, exactly. And it depends if you know the stage or not from previous years or whatnot. But if you, for example... Uh, with a trial and drive a, a brand new piece of road blind verse on good pace notes probably the best way to describe it is if you went up and down a road that you haven't driven before when you're out testing or even on a racetrack or whatever it may be generally by the fourth or fifth or sixth time if it's a short piece of road so let's say two or three kilometers it's enough that you can remember by the fourth or fifth of time you can start to actually drive it quite fast without pace notes what pace notes allows you to do is to drive it fast on the first pass so you're not waiting until you know the road after five or six attempts at it you would go and flat out the first time and that's where the pace notes have no room for error because if you've written your pace notes wrong in the in the reconnaissance you're driving to those pace notes and that can be the difference between you keeping it on the road or off the road because you have to have at our level anyway you have to drive 100 percent confidently to those notes you can't drive with 10% of margin thinking oh it might not be right because then you want to be at the back so a lot a lot of the work that we do in our sport is on the reconnaissance and that's why it's so important that we have good pace notes good recce good preparation and if you do all that it makes the actual rally weekend a lot easier. When it comes to repeating the same rally in most of the time the rallies are going to stay reasonably consistent in terms of the stages the start point the finish point so you kind of know what you're dealing with so when you're going back to the same rally time and time again and we do this with WRC but you do it here in New Zealand with the New Zealand Rally Championship at that point when you've done this rally let's say for the last 10 years and you know that stage like the back of your hand you've probably got onboard video you can review at that point do the do the pace notes sort of become less important and more just a sort of a casual reminder of what's coming up or are you still absolutely reliant on them as well still absolutely reliant but for probably a different reason so if it's a brand new stage you are like fully tuned on on the notes and processing everything and trying to read what's ahead of you by what you see as well but when it's on a, on a stage that you've done before and, and you've got good knowledge of especially here in New Zealand like often rallies are probably 50% um, the same stages each time you go back or they reverse them or whatever but when you're on a stage that you've got good knowledge of and there's a few here in New Zealand I still use those pace notes religiously but more so as a I guess a subconscious reminder for me of how I drive a corner so like if I hear a a half five right opens tightens for me in my head that just automatically I respond to that with a small break a downshift and a throttle so what the pace notes are then doing is not really telling me where to, where to go because I know where I'm going it's telling me how to drive each corner to its maximum uh, and actually I've had it before where you know there's a road that I know very very well but then you don't have your co-driver in the car with no pace notes you just got silence and you actually feel naked you just it, it, <laughs> it doesn't feel right because is that disconnect all of a sudden and you know as a driver you use those pace notes to help you drive that road as fast as you can yeah yeah absolutely i guess it just takes almost takes away one of your your senses that you've been relying on the whole time you're in a rally car so yeah i, I can understand that so let's move on from your your early career um well when i guess did you see a pathway to rallying becoming a career as opposed to just a sort of a, a fun pastime like most people would deal with it as yeah like it, it always seemed like a, a bit of a far-fetched dream for many many years it was obviously a, my dream since i was a kid but you know i hadn't even traveled outside new zealand didn't even know where europe was and at those days you know the wrc wasn't live you had to wait two or three weeks until you saw the, the highlights on tv and there was a big disconnect there between how you join those dots but you know I always had goals I every year I had new goals I had three-year goals 10-year goals and so I was always focused on those short-term goals and making sure we hit the targets and ultimately keep moving forward and it was probably once we start 
to be near the top of New Zealand Rally Championship where it felt like, hey, look, maybe we can try and make something of this. But the big factor for us was when we won the Pirelli Star Driver Scholarship in 2010, which gave us uh, six fully funded rounds in the Production World Championship in 2010. And to be honest, without that scholarship, we were in no position for ourselves to fund such an opportunity. Like that was effectively a million dollars New Zealand, what it would cost to do that championship. And without that scholarship, we would have never had that leapfrog to go from New Zealand to Europe. So there was an, an element of trying to be in the right place at the right time. You know, it's not necessarily about luck. It was about, you know, we knew these scholarships were there for two or three years and that's what we're building up towards. And even the center, uh, center dif- uh, differential tuning and things that we we're doing a couple of years prior to that, it was all building up to that. Uh, it was all building up to putting ourselves in the right place at the right time to try and create those opportunities. And then, of course, once we got over there, it was a matter of uh, creating new opportunities and, and making sure we're in the right place at the right time. So, I mean, without that opportunity, I'm guessing no WRC teams are sort of looking at a little local rally championship over here on the other side of the world to find their next star driver. So you really have to make it in Europe before you've got a chance of stepping into WRC? Oh, 100%. You have to prove yourself over there. You've also got to remember most of the World Rally Championship is predominantly based out of Europe in terms of the rallies, the teams, everything. So like for us, when we're doing New Zealand Championship for the three or four years prior, going out and doing Rally Otago, Rally Whongarei, whatever, that's equivalent to a lot of the young European drivers going to do Rally Portugal, Rally Spain, Rally Finland. So when they're learning, they're already learning the appropriate events. Once we go over, yeah, we've adapted the, the driving basics and pace notes and things, but then we've actually then got to go over and relearn all these events, which are completely different to New Zealand which the young guys over there, it was already part of their learning. So They've got a massive advantage. Yeah, you're always on the back foot, but you've just got to be patient with the process and there is no fast track way in. Like rallying is massive on experience, more so than circuit racing. We don't have simulators. You can't simulate rallies or conditions uh, that well. Yeah, there's onboard videos that you can get familiar with stages, but there's nothing like actually being there in the moment and, and feeling it in the car. And the only way you do that, you just got to get experience. You got And that, to get the experience obviously costs money. And a, very, and a very expensive sport. So um, there's a many different facets uh, to it to actually get in yourself in a position to then, I guess, market yourself as a, as a young driver that's you know got potential for a factory team. So I'm, I'm guessing here that your Pirelli scholarship worked pretty well because you did get into WRC, but join those dots up for us. How did that sort of process work out? Yeah, well, like it, was a, it was still a long process. We knew after that scholarship year, we had to keep funding ourselves in those support categories. So PWRC was equivalent of what, I guess, WRC3 is nowadays. So then we knew we had to get WRC2. We had to go up a spec in cars. We had to prove ourselves. We had to still get experience on a lot of new events that we hadn't done before. So we essentially spent the next three years in support categories that we self-funded which was effectively uh, towards $4 million that we had to fund over the, over the space of three years through shareholders, sponsors, a lot of people who got behind us. And, and I'd say 80 to 90% of that all came out of New Zealand still. So it was very humbling the amount of support we had, but it was a big job, big mission. But even through all that, we we're digging ourselves financial holes. You know, To be honest, looking back at it, there was probably two or three scenarios or situations here where we probably should have pulled the pin. Um, because it just didn't financially add up. But I guess we were so stubborn. And by that stage, I guess, so focused on the ultimate goal of trying to get into a WRC team that we just kept on pushing through. You just kept on trying to break down the barriers and certainly very challenging, but we believed in what we were there to try to achieve. Um, and you just had to stay focused on that. I mean, ultimately, you did break through. I mean, it wasn't all sort of champagne and caviar in the end, but you, you did break through and, and get a drive with Hyundai. So how did that come about? How did you sort of get it picked up by a WRC team? Again, a little bit about being in the right place at the right time. We are sort of at our wits ends in terms of financial demand. So luckily for us in 2013, Hyundai announced that they're going to be part of the WRC. So prior to that, there was only Ford and Citroen involved with reached out to them and tried to have conversations but there wasn't much interest here for a Kiwi driver at the end of the day it is a very commercial sport as well about where they want to sell cars and having relevant drivers or markets in place but then when Hyundai announced that they were entering in 2013 for the 2014 championship we saw that as an opportunity because obviously Hyundai has a big market in Australasia New Zealand Australia so we pretty much went after that like a hound dog we went through Hyundai New Zealand we went through Hyundai Korea we started building relationships with we who we knew the appropriate people were, were going to be in Europe for Hyundai Motorsport while we were in Europe and pretty much just wouldn't let it go over the time span of about six months in terms of just introducing ourselves, meeting people, talking to people, sending your CV, 
just yeah not letting not letting it go so yeah basically wore them down until they just said yes pretty much yeah yeah so they probably wanted to, to shut us up so uh but yeah, then of course, then the opportunity come for 2014 on a part-time program, which was an absolute dream come true to be representing a manufacturer. You know, if you want to make it in the top of any motorsport, you need to be in a manufacturer team. And at that stage, there was only three involved in the WRC. So to have that part-time program for 2014 come together was a massive pinch yourself moment. There was obviously funds involved. We had a, an investor involved to help that make, make that happen as well. But then of course, that's what gave us the opportunity. Once you got into that car, then you're in the right place to try and prove yourself up against world-class drivers to develop yourself and to try to have, a, uh, I guess, a long-term career there. Yeah, definitely. Getting the opportunity there to kind of benchmark yourself against the best drivers in the world, I can only imagine that, A, there's a huge amount of pressure that you'd be feeling in that situation, but B, you can learn so much from them. What was that experience like? Oh, massive learning. Like I'd say my driving went up tenfold being involved in the WRC team even in the first two years. I remember in 2014, we were the new kid on the block, so there wasn't much pressure on us in terms of results. Probably the most pressure come from myself because I don't like losing. But I do remember in Poland that year going along to one of the tests and Terry was testing for the rally as well. So I actually hopped in the car for him, which was actually one of the only times I hopped in the car with him. And just being in absolute awe of like how sideways, how attacking he was, how fast he was. And, and that was a real reality check for me to go, okay, that's actually what the, these cars are capable of doing. And that's how far you can push them. And I guess that combined with then in that team and environment, basically all the data is open between all the drivers. So over the course of the next two years, just with my engineer, just constantly working through the data of the other drivers, overlaying your data, comparing and just having that access to that sort of information helps you develop so much faster as a driver. And then through 2014, which is a learning year, come 2015, we're then all of a sudden, more often than not, the fastest driver in the team on gravel. And so that was a very big developing 12 months for us. It sort of helped you take a big step forward. And then that's what was a catalyst for us then to go forward into 2016, 17 and 18. Now, again, if my history is correct, it was 2016 Argentina that you ended up standing on the top step. I mean, that must be incredibly satisfying coming from such a small country in New Zealand and then competing on the world stage, the best of the best, and actually coming up tops. Talk us through the emotions. Definitely surreal. It was a, a pretty amazing day. Like the morning actually was probably one of the worst days of my life in terms of the pressure. When you had a, a seven-time world champion chasing you down in, in Seb Ogier, you just actually physically felt sick from the pressure. Like you knew you'd spent it wasn't just about that rally in that week. It was. It felt like it was like about the 15 years it took to get to that point. And watching, you know, my idols, Colin McRae and, and things as a kid doing those same rallies and everything, it just felt like an accumulation of so much that led to that moment. And obviously it come down to a last stage battle and it was a, an all or nothing type stage for us because the gap was down to two seconds and it was that opportunity to go, okay, we're not letting this opportunity go because you don't know when this opportunity is going to come again. And we just drove the stage of our life. And of course, then yeah, once you'd actually achieved it, then the afternoon uh, was essentially like the best day of your life. You, you still, you just didn't believe it. You're able to, to do something that you didn't think was necessarily possible. And it's a tough one because obviously incredibly proud that we're able to win that rally. And it's something obviously I'll have with me forever. But there's a sense of, I guess, not embarrassment, but it's a bit of a double-edged sword because I felt that we could have won more than one rally. And I, I didn't want to be remembered for winning just one rally. And okay, I haven't completely given up on that yet. It's a far-fetched thing now. But, you know, we, we had opportunities to potentially win more rallies. We just had things that didn't go our way. Obviously, we had quite a few podiums and a lot of stage wins, but we just weren't able to quite tick that box and trying to get a few more rally wins under our belt. I mean, let's get this in perspective. I think ticking that one box that you've ticked probably puts you in the top 0.01% of rally drivers anywhere in the world which is something that uh, no one can take away from you and you should be immensely proud of it is unfortunate that couldn't connect the dots on on a few more but you know I, I think that's still something that uh, have to really sit back and take credit for anyway. I just wanted to interrupt and take a moment out of our interview with Hayden and talk about a course package that I think you'll really enjoy and that is our track day package. This is perfect for anyone who's maybe thinking about taking that leap and getting the car on track for the very first time and we talked about the difficulties this can present to new competitors earlier in this interview with Hayden. Our track day package includes our race driving fundamentals course and this course as its name suggests teaches you some of the fundamentals of driving 
driving your car fast and safely on the racetrack while extracting maximum lap time and speed out of it. And understandably the skills of getting the best out of your car on a racetrack are dramatically different to what we've learned over the course of driving on public roads. There are some really key tips in here such as how to choose the ideal line for a section of your racetrack to set you up for the next section of track coming up. Also some of the things that are really easy to overlook like the importance of where you're actually looking on the track while you're driving at speed. Moving on we're also including our motorsport wheel line course and this teaches you how to perform your own wheel alignments and I know that most people would rely on an alignment specialist to do their alignments. That's fine but the problem with that is that you can't take uh, a four post wheel alignment machine to the racetrack with you, it's obviously not practical. So what happens when you get to the racetrack and maybe you want to make a small tweak to your camber, maybe to your toe or maybe it starts pouring down with rain and you've got a completely dry setup. Our motorsport wheel alignment course will teach you how to make changes to your own alignment. You'll also learn what those changes will do so that you know what you need to change in order to affect a certain outcome. This is all done with cost effective equipment such as a string alignment system. And if you're listening and thinking string alignment sounds a bit backyardish, and the reality is it's absolutely not. If you walk around the pits at any professional level race meeting, you're going to see teams using string alignment systems on all manner of cars so it is absolutely the standard right up to the top levels of professional motorsport. We're also including our practical corner waiting course now I'll admit this one is a little bit more niche again if you've walked around the pits at a professional race meeting you'll probably see that a number of the cars are set up on a flat patch with corner weight scales under each tyre and the premise here is that by adjusting the weight balance of the car corner to corner and we can do this by adjusting the ride height on individual corners we can affect the handling balance and the way the car feels on track to suit the driver. Moving on we're also including our data analysis fundamentals course and data analysis really is one of the key elements when it comes to improving both the car and the driver and while at the upper levels of motorsport data analysis systems can run to thousands and thousands of dollars you can also get a huge amount of benefit and a lot of data out of really simple data analysis tools such as the AIM Solo 2 DL just just a few hundred dollars but understanding what you're looking at and how to analyse it is also the key to getting the best performance out of a product like that. You'll learn everything you need to know within this course. We're also including 24 months of gold membership which gives you access to our live webinars. We hold these every week. You'll also get access to our back catalogue of webinars in our archive. We've got over 300 hours of existing content in there. One of the fastest ways to expand your knowledge on a huge range of performance automotive topics. You'll also get access with this gold membership to our private members only forum which is the best place to get trustworthy and reliable answers to your specific questions. Our track day package is normally valued at 397 US dollars but you can use the coupon code PADDEN100 that will get you $100 off this package. Even if you use that coupon code though you are still protected by our 60 day no questions asked money back guarantee so if you purchase and for any reason decide it's not quite what you expected or not right for you let us know we'll give you a full refund of the purchase price. All right, let's get back into our chat with Hayden now. Coming back to the earlier days with WRC, with Hyundai, I, again coming back from your book, I understand there were some problems with getting the car set up and handling how you wanted it to handle which kind of impacted your speed and, and results in those early days and I think again this could sort of come down to centre differential if, if my memory serves correct from that book. Can you talk us through that? Yeah, the first part through 2014, 15, 16, the cars were all mechanical differential and the 16 car, which was a one-year car, it only got introduced for one year. I actually got on very well with that car and it just suited me and my driving style. And But then come 2017, this is when the new generation WRC car was introduced, which they were amazing cars, awesome cars. They obviously had like an extra 100 horsepower, bigger wings, wider track. Uh, we went to, the, as you say, the, the electronic center diffs. So they're like effectively like the modern day Group B cars and they were an awesome car to drive. But at that time, there was politics going on. You know, we were essentially the second or third driver in the team, but we were getting results. And to be honest, I don't know what was happening in the background. There was obviously something happening in the background because all of a sudden we weren't able to be at the tests. We weren't able to be involved in development testing with the car. And then pretty much when we turned up for the start of the 2017 season with this brand new car, 
we had very, very limited time in the car. We didn't really have any say in, in the development route that the car went. And it was more or less developed away around one driver, if you like. And that's always the difficult thing with the sport is, you know, at the end of the day, you've got one car on a team. And the homologation doesn't allow you to have different setups or different um, homologations for different drivers. You need all your drivers to effectively work together because you've all effectively got the same car. And my driving style was was quite different. Terry Neville, who was the team leader, and you know he got on very well with the car. He was getting good results right from the word go. I struggled with the car. You know, all the differential settings that we'd had from previous years' cars were all gone. I was effectively driving on a car setup that I was never completely comfortable with. And we struggled all of, all of 2017 with that. Come 2018, we then finally got some differential ramps that were more in my direction and we made some changes. And then once I got that new change to the car in the last three rallies we did with that in 2018, we were on the podium twice. So it was, it was like a light switch that once we got those bits, it helped me a lot. And it wasn't about making the car faster. The car was essentially still the same speed, but it made me so much more comfortable as a driver. I could come on the throttle earlier. I just was felt at one with the car. Which comes back to what we were talking about earlier, just the confidence in the car is, is so critical. Yeah, exactly. But essentially it came 18 months too late and at the time we didn't know exactly what was going on with contracts and things in the background. Yeah, we didn't really get a fair chance on that one. So uh, that was just the way it was. Yeah, that's unfortunate. I think from the outside looking in, most people would assume that rallying for a manufacturer team in WRC is you know seven-figure contracts and private jets and all of the good things that come with that sort of rock star lifestyle. Is that the case? <laughs> no. Rallying is very underrated. Like you, you've got your top, I'd probably say, three or four drivers there who are on not bad salaries, but nothing like Formula One, nothing like other forms of, of circuit racing. Our first two years at Hyundai in 2014, 2015, we were funding. We had to fund quite a lot of money to be in that position, but obviously it was an opportunity for us. When we got our three-year contract for 16, 17, 18, yeah, we are on a salary, six-figure salary. I wouldn't say it was seven-figure. But then even at that, because we'd spent millions of dollars to get to that point, you know, the scheme and business scheme that we'd set up is that then any money that come in got paid back to shareholders. So 80% of all income ins then got paid back to shareholders to try and pay back their initial investment. So by the time I come back to New Zealand, actually, ironically enough, 2019 was probably going to be the first year that I was actually then going to get paid as a driver in full. But then 2019 is when we lost our contract. So when we come back to New Zealand in 2019, we had paid back the shareholders, which was obviously first and foremost. Uh, that was a big thing for me because they had a lot of trust and faith in us to begin with. And to pay them back was was a nice thing for us, I guess, personally. But yeah, financially come back no better off than what I was probably 10 years earlier. So it, it was never about the money. It was more about doing something that I love to do, the experience. And, you know, if I'm to, to, to say... I. I firmly believe rally drivers are not actually respected in the financial way as much as a lot of other motorsports. I'd say at the moment, there's probably only six or seven drivers paid in the world of rallying. If you compare that to circuit racing, there's hundreds of drivers paid in circuit racing from GT, Endurance, NASCAR, V8 supercars, Formula One, Formula E. There's so many opportunities in circuit racing and rallying. It's, it's driven by passion. It's, it's not driven by money. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting you get that inside perspective on it because, like I say, what we see from the outside is uh, obviously not a not a realistic take on what's going on. As you mentioned, you know, probably no driver in WRC is doing it for the money, but also when you're operating at that level, you, you kind of want to be rewarded for the results that you're getting. So, yeah, it's a bit of a double-edged sword there, I guess. In terms of your sort of move back out of WRC when your contract wasn't renewed I mean, obviously a tough a tough time in your life but can you talk us through sort of how that panned out yeah it was, it was unexpected because for three months uh, prior to the end of the 2018 season we had an agreement in place we had a gentleman's agreement we had many meetings we had shaken hands we agreed on the rallies and the terms and everything we were just literally waiting on the piece of paper but you know, as I was saying earlier, like as we were so loyal to the brand and, and brand loyalty was a big thing for me, they knew that we weren't going to go talking to other teams and that meant that they could just sort of hang us up on the fence, if you like, and just wait and see what was happening in the market. And then, of course, once Sebastian Loeb wanted to come out of retirement, of course, as a nine-time world champion, you, you're always going to want to sign them up. And as they uh, sort of kept us waiting, we were effectively the only driver that they could, I guess, easily get out of a contract with. So we are, I guess, a bit of a collateral damage to that if you like so yeah it was a shock it was unexpected did I think it was fair no I think we had a lot more to deliver and I think we could have delivered a lot more but I guess that lit a fire inside the guy okay 
I'm not done. Um, I sort of feel like I was at my peak at the time, driving wise. So it was about coming back to New Zealand and using that fire, if you like, to motivate myself to go, okay, let, let's go do this our way. Let's do this the Kiwi way. Let's set up a team and uh, get on with it. So um, come back to New Zealand, set up a new base here in, in Cromwell at Highland uh, in central Otago, New Zealand, and um, pretty much put a 10-year plan in place to try and get our own team back overseas, whether it's with me driving or not. Maybe in, in 10 years, I'm probably a bit old for it. Who knows? But it's about, you know, my passion for the sport is is more than just driving. I just love the sport. I love every every facet of it in terms of team management, in terms of building cars, developing cars, and a team working to, together to achieve, you know, pretty far-fetched results. And as a team, my goal is to have a New Zealand World Championship winning team. Okay, it's hard to say right now without a crystal ball what format of motorsport that is because right now it's hard to see where the future of WRC is. It's hard to see where it's all going with the tech and cars and how that's going to affect our sport. So, it's about us being adaptable and, you know, in the meantime, that's about our team getting some experience overseas, building the knowledge, building up the new um, tech with EV, hydrogen, hybrid cars so that we can put all the pieces of the puzzle uh, over the coming years and, and actually then put together a championship, I guess, structure. Okay. A bit to unpack there. So first of all, is it realistic? I'd love it to be realistic, but is it realistic from your perspective to go head to head with manufacturer funded teams in WRC from a, a New Zealand based team? WRC as it stands right now, no, but that's where the WRC is need to get it right because it needs to be in a position where there, are, there can be privateer teams, not even from a performance parameters, but even just from a financial side that privateer teams can afford to compete. At the moment, you can't. It's just completely unrealistic. You can't run a rally one hybrid car as a, as a privateer team. So they need to get that right so privateer teams can come back in again like it like it was 10, 15 years ago. And then when that opens up, then it does present opportunities for the likes of us. But that's why I'm not trying to be too narrow-minded because it may not be WRC that we're trying to fight for a world championship in come 2030. Maybe it's something in a an off-roading Dakar, rallycross. There's so many variables. For sure, it's, it's probably going to be something off-roading of some sort, whether it be rally or whatever. But we do have to keep an open minded on, on what that looks like. Okay, okay. Talking about the technology in the cars, I mean, the sort of, I kind of see over the 20 plus years that I've been in the industry, this obvious movement in technology, everything's moving forward, things are changing. And I kind of feel where worldwide motorsport is at the moment, I'm talking Formula One, WRC, just about everything. I kind of feel like at the moment there's not really a clear path forward. You know, you see Formula One with hybrid technology, with the Kerr system, with the uh, MGUH that they were running, I think that's gone for 2026, and then all of the arguments with the spectators around the sound of the current generation turbocharged engines versus the old V10s and V12s. And I'm not here to argue. I, I love the older the older engines, but obviously technology moves forward. We've got to try and keep it road relevant. And I mean, I think you'd have to be a, hiding under a rock if you didn't think that at some point in the future EV is going to be the dominant technology. So what's your take on it? I mean, I know you've got a, a dog in the fight with your uh, electric rally car, which we'll talk about shortly. But yeah, what's your take on the direction? What should motorsport be doing? It's really tough. And I think that's obviously why there's a lot of indecision at the moment, particularly within rallying in terms of where the future of the sport lies. Um, I think Formula One's a unique one. I, I think Formula One has got a product now through what they've done with Drive to Survive and, and a lot of the marketing and media, that as a sport, as a standalone and as a brand can stand on its own irrelevant of technology now. Because at the end of the day, a Formula One car doesn't look like a car you can buy. So Formula One is a standalone sport now, the same as rugby or cricket or whatnot. It's about fan engagement. It's about the battle between drivers and everything. Rallying doesn't have that, that luxury because rally has always been about, it, go back to the 90s with the Impresas and Evos and everything. Rallying has all been, always been about competing with a car that you can buy or that looks like something that you can buy. As I used to say, win on Sunday, sell on Monday. So the WRC has, if it's to go down the manufacturer route, has a responsibility to be relevant to what they sell. Like Hyundai Motorsport or Hyundai or Toyota and, and all these big factory WRC teams, you know, they're spending 100 million euros a year to do a, a WRC program. You know, they've got to sell a lot of cars to be able to justify that spend. And like the cars that they're selling, therefore, have to be relevant to what they're racing. Otherwise, it's effectively like racing a horse and selling the car. 
you know, often when I was in the doing some testing with Hyundai, we had one test where they had about 30 Koreans turn up with a whole lot of sensors and data and everything that they put on the WRC car. And they used a lot of that information and data that you now see in the end model performance cars. So they do use these motorsport programs to develop tech that ultimately gets to the daily road user car. So if the sport wants to have manufacturers, then there's no two ways about it. The sport has to have hybrid, hydrogen or EV technology. Otherwise, those manufacturers simply won't put money into it. The other side to look into it is you can then go the sporting avenue. And the sporting avenue is, okay, we can do this without the manufacturers. We can try and do this with corporate funding and try and do it with fans. And fan engagement is always going to be, in the short term anyway, is going to be around noise. It's going to be around excitement. And it's going to be around competitors. And like, you know, I keep using WRC as an example because that's what I'm familiar with. But like at the moment, WRC, there's effectively six or seven drivers there. As soon as two or three of them drop out, you've, you've almost got four or five cars on the rally. And in terms of fan engagement, that's not something that fans are going to engage with. If you have a privateer sport and you have 40, 50 cars, like even if the car's slower, so my example is a rally two car, put a bigger restrictor on it, bigger wing, a privateer team can then run that. You have 40, 50 cars, you've got the cars making noises, you've got competition, then all of a sudden you're going to have that fan engagement. So these two pathways, and at the moment I think they're sort of stuck in the middle, but a decision has to be made, and this might be the same in other forms of motorsport as well, but it's very clearly a decision has to be made on which way you go. I think the tough thing that rallying has compared to the likes of Formula One, and I mean they're not really comparable, but just on that point, I mean, you know, Drive to Survive has been obviously a turning point for Formula One and its popularity. And every round, they're basically seeing record numbers of people through the gates. And I mean, it's 350, 400,000 people. And it's relatively, there's not a lot of friction for a spectator other than paying your, your entry fee for your ticket. There's not a lot of friction to actually get, get among the action, whereas rallying, I've done it, it's, it's a hard sport. To, you've got to be pretty dedicated to be a, a rally fanatic. Generally, it's the middle of winter, you're traipsing out into the middle of the forest, it's five o'clock in the morning, it's pitch black and raining, and you stand on a corner, you, you watch the field come through, and then you've got to try and get to the next stage in another viewing spectator point before the the top cars get there so it's quite tricky for the spectators and I, I guess that's going to impact the, the sport in some way as well would that be fair? Oh, it's, it's definitely a different sport in that respect but I think that's what presents a sport different activation opportunities in terms of commercially in terms of I think the drivers the teams and the cars are a lot more accessible compared to Formula One you know you can get out in the forest you can actually stand beside the car while it's getting ready for the stage or you can do rally ride days and you take you know your customers out on the day after the rally and you, you get them to experience the sport themselves you get to see the service crew in action so you're yeah, very different like what you say but also more accessible you can do a lot more with media uh, you do a lot more live streaming yeah it is a different sport and you do have to be a passionate rally fan to really get the most out of it but I think there's a lot more that we the sport can do to engage more and to get more fans in as well because there is a lot of people that don't even know what rallying is or wouldn't know like you say how to even go out and watch a rally so th there's a lot more the sport can do to, to help itself all right so if hayden Patton was the king of world rallying and, and got to make his call on on what direction the sport takes what are we going are we going down the the hybrid path the full ev path or are, are we looking hydrogen Wh which in your opinion if you had to place your bet now is going to be the technology that wins out Personally, based on everything that's going on right now, I'd be going the sporting avenue of making a Rally 2 car faster and just trying to have a lot more cars there, like short term. And what I see is that your Dakar is the place where a lot of technology development's going on because Dakar is like the extreme of extremes in terms of long distance rally over two weeks in the desert and the rivers and the floods, everything. And right now you're seeing a lot of EV hydrogen development going on there and that's where the manufacturers can prove their technology in the most demanding arena, if you like. So I see Dakar and WRC working together in a perfect world where Dakar is where the tech development happens, but using those manufacturers in Dakar to also support the WRC side, but then maybe short-term WRC is still using, let's say, old conventional combustion engines on a short-term basis to keep that fan engagement with the noise and with the spectacle and, and everything. But beyond all that, I guess, answer to your question, I think the hydrogen, everyone wants to get on the hydrogen bandwagon but the, the fact of the matter with hydrogen Toyota are really the only ones experimenting at the moment with liquid hydrogen everyone else is more more so fuel cell stack which is still an EV car 
Um, we're looking into hydrogen at the moment with some of our projects, but you're effectively still an EV car. You, you got your battery, you got your you got your electric motors, and you got your hydrogen system providing energy to complement the battery. Um, as I say, Toyota is probably one of the only exceptions to that. So when you look at it, that more traditional hydrogen system that the majority of manufacturers are doing, then I'd say electric is probably still the, the better way forward uh, for short performance, high performance motorsport applications because out of hydrogen, you just can't get the same energy density. You can't get the same energy output as what you can out of full electric. So in terms of outright performance, it's still coming from electric. But then, of course, the problems with electric is range, you know, trying to get it over a long period of time, particularly in rallying. You effectively need like a one-ton battery in the car, which is not practical. So, um, but that tech's changing yeah. as well because I believe solid-state battery will be a game changer. That could be three, four, five years away. But you know, once that battery tech changes, then it could be a different conversation altogether. In the way I sort of see it, admittedly, I'm not deep in the EV world. We are developing an electric vehicle course at the moment, but I mean, the way I sort of see it is the advancements we've got in road-going EVs at the moment have really come about as this latest generation of battery technology that's kind of made it viable. We've kind of got range that's now suitable for a road-going car, but of course that range, particularly when you're extracting so much energy out of the battery so quickly in a motorsport application, the range isn't suitable. I kind of wonder if it is just going to be that next generation of battery technology that sort of changes everything and, and all of a sudden it, it is viable, but that remains to be seen. The other element is there is some concern around you know, utilising EV, full EV in, in motorsport applications. I've talked to a couple of people recently have sort of said Australia has taken a pretty uh, firm stand on no EVs for motorsport. I, I don't have all of the details of that, but I mean, obviously there's concerns and risk around fire. As I understand it, if you kind of have a, a thermal runaway event with the current lithium ion batteries, you basically have to let the thing burn to the ground so what's your sort of take on that is it a real concern or is it being blown out of proportion completely blown out of proportion and there's a lot of miseducation and a lot of misinformation out there i'd have to say as well you you are right in saying if there is a thermal runaway event the car essentially will probably burn to the ground you know a lot of the cars and a lot of the high-end ev cars often have a fire system built into the battery to try and manage a thermal runaway event but the part that people forget and gloss over is the likelihood of a fire out of an EV car is so much less likely than a combustion car. And yeah, okay, we've seen a couple of instances recently of EV cars burning. Uh, there was a couple of rallycross cars in the UK. But I mean, like, it always seems to be a front page headline story that if an EV, even out on the road, an EV car burns to the ground and whatnot. There was a stat that I saw recently. It's something like 0.8 of a percent is what the relative the chance of an EV car is going on fire compared to a combustion car. There are combustion cars burning down all the time. Yeah, but they don't make the headlines, do they? That's the problem. Don't make the headlines. Uh, same, I've had two rally cars burn to the ground before. Uh, and likewise, when you have a rally car start going on fire in the middle of a forest, is gone anyway. The chances of you putting it out with a, with a 2 kg fire extinguisher in the middle of nowhere is very, very seldom. So yes, there is, if the car goes on fire, it's not good but then you've also got to remember if there is a, a malfunction in the car so for example with our ev car we have so much warning if something's going wrong if we have a thermal a thermal runaway event starting we could have 30 to 60 minutes to try and respond to that in terms of putting the car in a safe place where it's not going to damage anything else you know it's motorsport we take the risk that these things can happen in terms of damaging the car or you crash or it burns or whatever it, it's just motorsport so the biggest factor is making sure people are safe in terms of volunteers, marshals, and not doing damage to forests or, or infrastructure. So I believe it's mostly blown out of proportion. The more that I've learned with this car, I actually feel safer driving this car than the combustion car in terms of all the safety um, parameters that are, that are built into the, to, into the battery, into the technology. And then you've got no spark. You've got nothing that's going to create spark. So it, it is a different kettle of fish, and it is this education at the end of the day. And at the end of the day, if we don't know something about what we don't know then we're often tend to be probably too safe or too scared about it rather than trying to be open-minded about it yeah i mean it's definitely still early days in terms of mass adoption for motorsport so yeah as you say people tend to be a little bit sort of apprehensive about what they don't understand and, and what's new but i guess you know it's inevitable that as time goes past things will change and and the rules will evolve now it's probably a good segue into talking about your electric rally car so give us a maybe a high level view of of what that is and and why you decided to go down that path yeah well I, I look probably continuing a little bit from when we come back here in 2019 it was you know about 
trying to create a project that was going to give us a point of difference. And prior to that, a couple of years earlier, actually, someone planted the seed about building an EV rally car. And I, I think I laughed them off the phone at the time because I'm as much of a, a petrol nut as anyone else. But during my time with the WRC team and then obviously working with a lot of our sponsors, it became very obvious to me that we needed to be more commercially uh, relevant to create the opportunities to help essentially fund what we do to, to help keep the sponsors and keep the, the funding coming in. But also as a small team on the other side of the world, we needed a point of difference to stand out from the crowd in terms of just running another combustion rally car or program or just the same as hundreds of other motorsport teams. So we uh, made the decision to build one of the first EV rally cars in the world in 2019. We did it all in-house here, apart from working with a technical partner uh, in Europe who helped us with battery and motor. But then on the software side, we did it all, the um, design of the car, everything um, we did in-house. And then we launched that car uh, late 2020. And uh, yeah, we've been sort of developing the car ever since now. Um, we sort of probably get into phase two of the project, which we hope to implement over the next probably 12 months to take it to the next level. Yeah, it's been quite an eye-opener already, this project in terms of just even setting up a car. Like we've learned so much from all the cars that I've driven over 20 years. And generally, a lot of the things and a lot of the practices are pretty similar from car to car. In this car, everything was like, seemed to be upside down in terms of how you set up the suspension, how you set up the diffs, the weight transfer and, and the weight distribution of the car, even how you drive the car. Everything's completely different. And from my side, I've actually really enjoyed that challenge because it's sort of, I guess, freshened things up again and it's not the same old... Um, we're actually having to put the trainer wheels back on and, and learn the game. So a couple of elements there. It seems from the outset like a, quite a brave move. You've basically built a car where, at least if I'm getting this right, there's really no class for it to race in. So basically, at least at the outset, it's it's an exhibition car and then it comes back to the problems with battery range. So even if it was allowed to compete in the New Zealand Rally Championship, it, it's not going to be really able to effectively. Am I right? It is a, a proof of concept is what we're trying to do, more so for our sport as, as well as for us as a team, but also trying to prove that there are solutions for our sport and to try and help the, the longevity in the future. But yeah, like at the moment, we can do hill climbs and sprints in New Zealand. We've obviously worked with Motorsport New Zealand on the safety aspect to allow the car to be accepted into events. So now we can um, compete against combustion cars. And then, yeah, going forward, the ultimate goal is to have it compete in the New Zealand Rally Championship as a rally car up against normal rally cars. And that's been a big personal thing for me is to make sure that this car can compete against combustion cars. My interest to build an EV car to compete in an EV championship on this side of the world where you're never going to get a lot of EV uptake in the meantime anyway has never been that great. You know, I want to prove the tech against something that we already know and something that we already enjoy. Not to say that I'm pro or con either way. As I say, I love both. But the biggest thing I love is going fast. And, I, and that's the, the biggest appeal to me is that these cars can go faster. Yep, noise is a whole different argument. And I fully accept that race cars need to make noise. But if you put that side of the argument aside and look at every other aspect, then I see there's a lot of potential there for it to be exciting from a driver uh, and a spectator side. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, the, the noise element is tricky. I, I've been to Pikes Peak a couple of times and, you know, to add insult to injury, not only do the, the EVs that compete there sound like in a radio controlled car, but then they make them put a siren on the damn things to, you know. That's so bad. You never want to put a siren on. Makes it makes it that much worse, which is super unfortunate. In terms of, there's a couple of elements I wanted to dive into. In terms of if you can get to a point where you can compete on an even playing field with with uh, internal combustion vehicles in a rally championship. Interested to see what the thoughts are around balance of performance. Obviously with rally cars, the engine formula is pretty stringent and we've got inlet restrictors, which for all intents and purposes limit you know, how much power ultimately, how much air you're going to get through that restrictor, that's how much power you can make. With an EV, you know, <laughs> slightly different. So how would Motorsport New Zealand go about trying to get a balance of performance so you're not just making 300 horsepower more than the next closest competitor? There's two sides to that. I see the balance of performance be quite easy to implement firstly the cars are going to be a lot heavier anyway um, we, we can't get around that so the weight's on that not an issue and then on a power side you can do it as simply as locking the mapping we can pretty much map the car to be 200 kilowatts through 50 kilowatts 300 kilowatts whatever it may be and you can control all that and, and that's no different at the moment how in a rally 2 car for example the turbo boost is limited to don't quote the number, I think it's something like 1.6 or 1.8 bar. And that's managed through an FIA electronic system to make sure they don't exceed that limit. 
And you could do the same with the mapping of an EV car that you make sure you don't exceed a certain power rating. And then that's the power you've got, essentially. So you could introduce that very easily. It would take a bit of work in terms of dyno work and working with all the applicable parties. But the other interesting thing, and the, the thing I like about EV for rallying, if, for example, you had a whole lot of EVs or hybrids, whether it be in WRC or what, whatnot, is that you could do balance and performance between the different teams and different drivers based on battery pack size. So, And then you have event organizers, for example, that say they have to have a, a loop of stages, has to be between 40 and 50 kilometers between a stage. And then to the, to the teams, you say, okay, your battery can only be 60 kilowatt hours big. But then it's up to the teams to then determine how they want to use that 60 kilowatts of power over that 50 kilometers. And what the, the reason why I like that is it brings a lot of tactics in because then you might have some teams that go, okay, we're going to go 400 horsepower on the first stage. We're going to go 200 on the second stage and 300. That's how we're going to manage it. And you're going to get all this tactics because more often not in, in the sport of rallying. And I don't think it's about falsely trying to interpret competition or try and create competition. I think it's just about bringing in a bit of dramatics, a bit of a storyline. Too often not in rallying, we see the person who goes out and wins the first stage is often there for the whole rally. It's, you know, it's very predictable sometimes. So it's about trying to bring in that aspect for the spectators. Some tactics, like any other sport, there's tactics involved in, in pretty much every sport. And that's how I think you could uh, control that performance parameters if you had a whole lot of EV cars competing together. Yeah, it would definitely make for a more interesting spectacle, I think. In terms of the driving characteristics of internal combustion versus EV, what can you tell us about how your electric rally car feels to drive? What, what are the key differences? I can say with hand on heart, it's the best car I've driven, uh, better than a world rally car in terms of handling. More so when you're going uphill, actually. When you're going downhill, not so much because we're about 200 kilos too heavy at the moment. So you really feel that on the downhill sections in terms of braking and trying to slow the car. But on flat or uphill, phenomenal. Like the, the, the biggest thing is the center of gravity is so low and the weight distribution is all between the axles. We effectively have no overhung weight in front of the front axle or behind the rear axle. So the stability of the car is just phenomenal. It, it almost feels like a slot car in terms of it being stuck to the road. And because of that, the car is more agile. You can throw the car around more. So I think you can be more spectacular with the car. So you can throw it a lot more sideways and you can straighten it up. You, you sort of have a lot more control of the agility of the chassis. It's a lot more predictable. And that's you know that's solely the biggest advantage at the moment. There's a lot more to come on the drivetrain side and the power um, delivery. Um, everyone thinks, oh, an EVK, you've got instant power, that must be great. But actually, in a rally um, application, it's a limitation because our grips only as much as what the tyres can handle. So you put all this full amount of electric power and response through on a loose surface, you just have a lot of wheel spin. So we've actually got to counter that a lot at the moment by detuning the car to make sure we can get traction. And then, of course, that's something we can wind up over time as tyre development continues or suspension development continues so we can try and get that power to the ground better. Okay. All right, so moving moving back out of order a little bit, let's just park the EV side of things for a moment. Coming back to New Zealand, you've been actively involved in the New Zealand Rally Championship again, and just sort of following some of the rallies that you're involved with, assuming obviously no mechanical issues with the car, you're generally sort of beating P2 by several minutes and I'm interested obviously that experience in WRC must have been super beneficial but what would you put down to your dominance in New Zealand compared to the other competitors here locally is it that skill set that you developed internationally or is it car development or all of the above uh, I think it's a combination of everything. Obviously, we've got some really good people involved in our team here. So in terms of car preparation, making sure the cars are fast and reliable is a big big part of it. The relationship with John, like you say, uh, is a big part of it. But the biggest factor is simply because, you know, it's what I did as a profession for many years. You're doing it all the time, whether it be testing or driving. Okay, nowadays you don't drive as much as what you used to. But still, that experience that you gain from being in the WRC with the engineers, your teammates, knowing how to extract performance from a car, probably even just knowing what fast feels like because that's the biggest thing in the rally. You, you don't see your competition. You haven't got an instant gauge, oh, I did that corner bad because he pulled away through the chicane or whatnot. In rally, you have to be able to gauge what feels fast yourself from the seat of your pants. So it's just all that experience, I think, that helps. And the biggest thing is here in New Zealand, like there's some good young drivers here. There's a lot of drivers doing very well, but it is a hobby. Everyone in New Zealand, including myself, we all have full-time jobs. Um, they come out on the weekends and they do six rallies a year 
most of the time with no testing so very limited mileage and then they're just getting out and, and, you, and you often find a lot of the competitors in New Zealand they as the rally goes on they get faster and faster and faster because they're just getting more in tune with the car and, and getting more used to it so I guess you could say we have a little bit of an unfair advantage simply because that's what I've done as a profession but still it's about no matter how much we've done in the past or how prepared we are we still got to have the whole package you know we still got to prepare you got to have good pace you've got to have a good car good team same with any team sports all right the other rallying that you're involved with at the moment and you're i think pretty close to the end of this championship is the european rally championship or erc which uh, i think last time i checked you're leading by about 50 odd points 55 points i think it is what made you sort of get involved with that is that sort of come back to if you want to be relevant on the world stage you have to be in europe Oh, 100%. If we want to be creating opportunities for both myself and the team, we need to be in Europe. Obviously, COVID sort of locked us up here for two or three years. So we're sort of on the back end of that, trying to get back to a bit of normality in terms of being back over there on a regular basis. And we obviously started with a small WRC2 program last year with our own car and our own team. The initial plan is that we were then going to do a full WRC2 championship this year. But what we sort of learned last year, there was probably two main facets to the decision to go to European Championship is one, Going into the WRC2 rallies, you're at the back, you're behind the Rally 1 cars, the roads are destroyed, it becomes a bit of a lottery if you do or don't break the car. And as a driver, you know, that's not what I enjoy. I enjoy, enjoy driving flat out, I enjoy good roads. That's why we rally, is to go out and, you know, enjoy some of the best roads in the world. So you want to be the first competitor on the road, not the last. Yeah, exactly. But also, like, I'm in a different stage of my career as well. Like, if you're a young driver coming through the ranks, then yes, you have to be in WRC too because you've got to get experience of the appropriate events and, and prove yourself to the right people. I'm past that stage now. I don't need to be proving myself to anyone. So we're doing it for ourselves and to try and be, put ourselves in Europe and, and to be competitive. And, you know, European Championship, the Rally 2 car is the top car. You're there competing for Rally wins. Um, there's 40, 50 cars like this the strongest competition I've ever competed against in terms of the amount of fast drivers you have on any given rally. And you're there competing for rally wins. WRC2, you, you're there just to compete for class wins. And as a driver, having done it for a few years now, you know, winning rallies is what rocks my boat, not winning your class at the back of the field, well, behind the rally one cars. And, you know, European Championship gives us that chance to be at the front competing for rally wins, competing for championship wins. And then, of course, the bonus of it all is that, you know, European Championships probably not quite, but is a little over half of the budget of WRC2. And obviously, when you're coming from New Zealand, especially at the moment, there's certainly a bit of a pinch going on around the world economy-wise. Finances play a big part of it as well. Yeah. Well, on that note, sort of how important is the sort of, I guess, sponsorship side of professional rallying versus actually just being fast in the car? I mean, unless you're incredibly well-funded personally, I'm guessing that relying on, on getting good sponsorship and companies backing you is going to be essential if you want to be able to demonstrate how good you are. It's a combination of both. Obviously, you need to be fast. You can get the results. You can try and be in the media coverage and, and whatnot to get the exposure for your partners. But just being fast alone is not enough to have partners and sponsors. You know, we do a lot of work in the background with activation on doing work with our partners behind the scenes, rally ride days, customer days, events. That's where the real value actually comes for our partners. Um, having a sticker on a car is actually debatable how much value that actually brings. And it's certainly not measurable. So you, you need to be doing these activities outside the supporters, which is where the sponsors get the value from. And yeah, we're just building relationships. That's been ever since I went and got my first sponsor for $100 when I was driving my Mini when I was 12 years old. That's probably been the biggest part of my life now for the best part of 25 years is going out, getting sponsors, working with sponsors, building those relationships and keeping them building. So, you know, even this year, I think we've got 28 corporate partners uh, on board with what we're doing. That's a big part. We wouldn't be rallying overseas without our partners. We wouldn't even be doing the EV car or a New Zealand program without our partners. So it, it all works together. I mean, we could probably hold a, a podcast on this topic alone, but are there any key elements of advice you'd give to young up-and-coming motorsport enthusiasts in terms of how to get and cultivate sponsors? It's hard. Cold calling is always very hard. So more often than not, it all comes through contacts. And in New Zealand, we're lucky that we're probably separated by two degrees of separation here. So it's about leaning on people who know people and getting introductions and people who are passionate about not only about what you do, but about the sport. You have to be pitching to people who, who have an interest in motorsport. 
But then the, the easiest way I look at it is that when you're putting a proposal on someone's desk, is trying to think outside the box in terms of what you offer them. Don't just offer them a sticker on the car and it's going to cost X amount and I'll go out and make sure your brand's on TV. You've got to think bigger than that. You've got to think, what am I actually going to physically do to go help them sell more product or look after their current customer base to, to help them get value out of it? And a simple way of looking at it is if, if who you're approaching has got 100 proposals sitting on their desk, because often everyone gets approached a lot by people for sponsorship, how is your proposal going to stand out from those other 100? And that's, that's the easiest way to think about it. What are you going to put in that proposal that stands out from the crowd? how you're going to approach them. And then, of course, once you got them is how you look after them. Big thing for me is under-promise and over-deliver. And by working on that sort of philosophy, then you can build the relationship and you keep over-delivering and it allows you to build it into bigger things going forward. I, I had I had exposure to the other side of that sponsorship deal, which was being asked for sponsorship when I ran my old company. And um, the thing that always came through was people would come with their hand out asking for X, Y, Z, and typically the, the handful of people that we actually sponsored, I, I think out of, out of sort of six or eight people we sponsored over 10, 15 years that we're running that business, you know, basically you never heard from 90% of them again. Once the deal was done and they, they had whatever it was they wanted, that was the end of it. Which I mean, I guess works for them in the short term, but if you want to build up a long term relationship, you absolutely, it needs to be a two way street. And I think there was one competitor that we dealt with and after every event, we got an email report on, on the event with some photos that we could use and you know, it's just small things like that, which only take a bit of time, not a lot of money. You know, that, that's, that's what really makes a big difference, I think. So you know, some tips there, like I say, we could go on for hours about sponsorship, but we won't. And I do want to uh, move towards wrapping this up anyway, Hayden. And we do so with the same three questions that we ask all of our guests. And the first of those is, what's next in the future for you? I mean, you've given us a little bit of insight already, but anything else you want to add to that for you and uh, Patton Rally Group? Yeah, obviously, short-term goal is to try and win European Championship this year. That's never been won by a non-European in its 70-year history. So that's something that uh, means a lot for me and the team. So we've put all our eggs in the basket to try and achieve that this year. And so far, so good. But never count your chickens before they hatch. So uh, trying to wrap that up and then obviously build on a program within Europe next year as well and, and try and get our team more involved as well. And then ultimately, you know, we're looking towards that sort of 2030 to try and have our own team competing um, globally, competing at a high level. So um yeah, step by step, we'll just keep working towards that. Exciting times. Next question, is there any advice you'd give to a younger version of yourself or maybe one of our younger listeners to help reach where you are today in your career faster? And admittedly, you've got quite a unique career, but I'm interested in anything that uh, you can add to that. I don't know if you'd necessarily want to do it faster because I think by doing it in a methodical way, you get the necessary experience to make sure you, you're best prepared once you get the opportunities. Probably the best advice I've, I've always thought of is you've got to be so patient, particularly when you're young. When you're young and eager, you want things to happen quickly. But in motorsport, it doesn't happen quickly. You, and you've, you've got to ride the lows just as much as the highs. It's not all roses all the time. So because of that, you have to be super patient. You have to build the experience and and networking is a big thing as well, making sure you're networking with the right people, putting yourself out there. And then between being patient and networking, then hopefully all the pieces of the puzzle can come together uh, over the over the following years. Yeah, uh, great advice. Last question for today. If people want to find out more about you, follow you and see what you're up to, how are they best to do so? Got any social media accounts or anything else they can follow? Yeah, of course, we've got all the social media. So uh, paddenrallysport.co.nz and then, of course, we're on Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter, I think we even got a TikTok now. I don't really know much about TikTok, but anyway, <laughs> we're learning. We're learning as we go. So uh, yeah, all the channels are under Hayden Pad. Perfect. Well, we'll put links to uh, all of those accounts in the show notes to make it easy for people to find. I think, yeah, TikTok's one I've personally tried to stay away from, but got to move with the times and give the people what they want. So yeah, HP, HPA also on TikTok, believe it or not. All right, thanks uh, again for your time, Hayden. Really interesting chat. And uh, with that European Rally Championship sort of closing up in the not too distant future, we wish you all the best to clinch that first non European title. Yeah, great. And no, I really appreciate it. Good to catch up. If you enjoyed this episode of Tune In with Hayden Patton, we'd love it if you could drop a review on your chosen podcasting platform. These reviews really help us to grow our audience and that in turn helps us to continue to get more high quality guests. To say thanks, each week we'll be picking a random reviewer and sending them out an HPA t-shirt free of charge anywhere in the world. This is also a great place to ask any questions you might have too, and I'll do my best to answer them if your review gets picked. 
So this week a big shout out to Michael Handler from the United States who has said, extremely valuable, this podcast is worth having to pay for. Well Michael, glad that you're seeing value in the podcast but safe to say it is going to be free to listen to forever. If you get in touch with your t-shirt size and shipping details we'll fire a fresh tea straight out to you. All right, that concludes our interview and before we sign off, I just wanted to mention for anyone who's been perhaps hiding under a rock and hasn't heard of High Performance Academy before, we are an online training school and we specialize in teaching a range of performance automotive topics, everything from engine tuning and engine building through to wiring, car suspension and wheel alignment, uh, data analysis and race driver education. Now remember, you've got that coupon code, you can use podcast75 at the checkout to get 75 dollars off the purchase of your first course you'll find our full course list at hpacademy.com forward slash courses important to mention that when you purchase a course from us that course is yours for life as well it never expires you can rewatch the course as many times as you like whenever you like the purchase of a course will also give you three months of access to our gold membership that gives you access to our private members only forum which is the perfect place to get answers to your specific questions. You'll also get access to our regular weekly members webinars, which is where we touch on a particular topic in the performance automotive realm. We dive into that topic for about an hour. If you can watch live, you can ask questions and get answers in real time. If the time zones don't work for you, that's fine too. You're going to get access as a gold member to our previous webinar archive. We've got close to 300 hours of existing content in that archive. It is an absolute gold mine. So remember that coupon code PODCAST75. Check out our course list at hpacademy.com forward slash courses.